I'm Bob Ward. I'm the deputy director here at the Rockefeller Institute, and I, uh, on behalf of Tom Gaze and uh, all of our colleagues, I welcome you this afternoon. Tom is out of town and not able to be with us, but um, we are all uh, uh, fascinated by this topic and looking forward to a great discussion. I'm just going to uh, uh, speak for a minute or two and then turn it over to Rick Matthews. Um, one of the uh, uh, efforts that uh, we have been undertaking here at the Institute and the College over the last couple of years is to try to collaborate on uh, a number of new initiatives, uh, new programs and forums like this one, and we are very pleased that um, uh, the uh, important topics under discussion today are uh, one of the fruits of those efforts. Um, the um, uh, National Center for Security and Preparedness, and uh, I hope I'm not taking anything away from Rick's uh, uh, introduction, uh, is, uh, was established in July 2007 as a, a new effort to uh, uh, study many of these important issues that are arising, not only here in New York, but obviously across the country. And um, uh, many of us were uh, delighted <coughs> when uh, Rick Matthews was selected as the uh, uh, director of the National Center. Rick um, uh, serves as an adjunct faculty member in Rockefeller College's Department of Public Administration and Policy, as well as uh, directing the center. Before accepting the, this current position, he served as the assistant director for research and development at the National Center for Biomedical Research and Training, um, Academy of Counterterrorist Education at Louisiana State University uh, from January 2002 through July 2007. He has a, uh, a broad background of professional experience in um, uh, emergency medical services, hospital administration, emergency preparedness, counterterrorism, and homeland security, uh, all of the uh, issues that um, uh, nowadays we think of under the uh, rubric of security and preparedness. So we are um, uh, very uh, happy to have Rick kicking us off uh, today. He will introduce uh, our moderator and panelists. Uh, and uh, again, welcome to the Rocket Fire Institute, and I'll turn it over to Rick Matthews. Thanks, Mark. When we were asked about uh, something for around 9-11 and what was significant and what are some of the things that have changed so much since uh, those horrific attacks, one of the, the things that I find most interesting and most probably biggest change is how we actually chase terrorists. What do we do? Uh, how do we do it before those attacks? Uh, how do we chase criminals? Um, you know, I remember I worked the, uh, my career worked the Oklahoma City bombing that morning. And uh, I remember, you know, about getting about two hours after the actual explosion, looking around, and damn, big hole, huge thing. How could this happen in the United States? In that case, it was a uh, uh, a bad guy, uh, a U.S. citizen, former military guy that did it with some help. Um, but it shocked us. Um, it shocked us in terms of the preparedness side of the house. What should we do in terms of being prepared in the United States? But it didn't shock us enough to think about how to prevent it, how to protect against it. Um, uh, and so we, we got past the part that we had the first trade center. It, it made news. We didn't do a whole lot about it afterwards. But on 9-11 uh, was our wake-up call. And a lot of things that took place, probably one of the most, I think, interesting and most uh, um, potentially life-changing for what we do was in fact what the Patriot Act did for us or could do for us or has caused to us, depending upon how you look at that act, uh, provisions of it, the laws that it, that it intersects, the way we conduct business. You know, and people ask me all the time, you know, are, are we safe, are we getting better? And really it comes down, I think, a couple of things. You know, we in the United States, are happy with our country. We have the most best liberties, but the best place to live in the world. Uh, we can go from one state to the other without showing identification. We can do all kinds of things without seeing a police officer in a bad way. We can cross in and out of the country relatively easily. Uh, we, we, it's a good life. We have a lot of freedoms. Could we be more secure? Yeah. We probably wouldn't like it, I don't think. 
a lot of the things that we hold true and our freedoms will have to be really tramped on, I think, and really restricted to be a lot safer, perhaps. And even then, no guarantee that we're going to be totally safe. You think about it now. We still don't like the fact that we have to take off our shoes and we have to only carry three ounces of fluids or more on a bottle on a plane. There's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, we don't like to walk through the serpentine lines. We don't like for people to look at us and look at our behaviors. We don't like any of those things. Um, a lot of those things are perhaps necessary. I think all of us would agree that we like to prevent an act before it happens. And the prevention of terrorist acts is really what this discussion is about. And then again, how we prosecute it later um, and so on. When asking about th this panel, we, we put together what I think is a very interesting dynamic and certainly um, different sides of the House panel. Uh, we're going to be moderated today by uh, Paul Klein. Uh, Jim Clark is the one we advertise. Jim uh, uh, had a, has an emergency in his family, could not make it. Um, arguably, which is going to be better, Clarky or Paul? I'm not sure which. They're both probably very equally good, equally witty, equally great moderators. So we're very happy to have Paul. Paul is a former district attorney here, uh, practices in private sector now, involved in building training and training prosecutors, defense attorney, cops and people for many, many, many years. Uh, received his law degree down the street at Albany Law School. Uh, got an undergraduate degree from SUNY, not from Albany, but from SUNY. Uh, and, uh, and, and now uh, uh, he's here to help us today, guide the ship, as we say, through, through the, uh, today's proceedings. As we go through this, we're going to have a period of where we're going to have uh, a few opening comments by the panelists. Paul will have a couple of comments. The panelists will have a couple of comments. And then there will be a series of questions and discussion that Paul will lead the group through. At the end of that, there will be a, uh, a relatively short opportunity for questions and answers to the panel from the audience. And then I know that most of those will be around for a little while after that if there's uh, any other one-on-one you know, -on -one questions you may want to ask. Our panel, though, we're very, very fortunate in our panel. Uh, we have, on the far left, we have Kevin Lewebrand, who's a, um, a civil liberties attorney, I guess the best way to put it, extraordinaire. Has personal experience, great deal of experience in defending not just criminals, but is also involving people that have been involved in being uh, prosecuted for crimes involving terrorism. He is a... Uh, 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 been here for over 28 years, over 100 cases in state and federal courts, uh, specialized, as I said, in federal civil rights, uh, federal criminal defenses. He's had two cases he's tried where the Patriot has actually been involved. Uh, and I think you'll find him a very, very able uh, debater today uh, uh, on these proceedings. Next to him, we have uh, Jim Horton. Jim uh, is now the assistant director of the Office of Counterterrorism. He runs the public safety shop at the Office of Counterterrorism for the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services. Um, he's been over 21 years as a state uh, police officer, most of which he is involved uh, investigating crimes, major crimes, prosecuting the bad guys, over 200 homicide investigations. Um, from there, he left uh, in, in and joined the uh, New York State Attorney General's office where he became a deputy chief investigator and um, um, continued in what he was doing. He's had extensive history in teaching and instruction. Uh, he knows this area well. He participated in a variety, variety of specialized trainings. He's either given training, received training, uh, probably been the subject of training. Uh, he received numerous combinations and awards and, and what I know, I'm very, very passionate, very, very able, very experienced, and, individual and very happy to have him on the panel today helping us. Next to him is uh, my good friend Boris Letter. Boris comes to us today from Annapolis. He's uh, been over 27 years with the military and government, working from both uh, in, in the Department of Defense, uh, then with the Department of State. Uh, most of his, his act he's been doing everything from uh, in counterterrorism, terrorism interdiction, uh, intelligence collection involved in chasing terrorists, if you will, particularly before 9-11, and in many, many areas since then in terms of trying to help keep us safe now. Uh, works uh, on a lot of very policy areas now in both uh, the Department of Defense, Department of uh, Homeland Security, 
Department of State and others. Um, and again, we're very, very uh, lucky to have him here with us today, too. And finally, and certainly not least, we have the uh, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District, uh, Richard Hartunian. Um, he is, we're just happy to have him here. He's a great deal of experience both now and before this posting. Um, he has, uh, God, he's done everything. He's vice chair of the Border uh, and Immigration Subcommittee of the Attorney General's Advisory Committee. It's a long name for an important person. Um, Clark told me to tell you that. Uh, uh, he deals in a wide variety of areas as you might expect in the attorney's office. He's came out of here. He's uh, uh, serves one of the nation's principal litigators. Um, he's uh, um, has some personal experience as well uh, in terms of of, of, the, of the, the consequences of terrorism. Uh, very able uh, debater. Very able uh, uh, litigator and. Uh, Extremely happy to have him here and bring the federal perspective to this debate. With that all that being said, uh, my seven minutes of fame are up. I turn this Augusta over to you, Paul. Have fun. All right. Um, uh, just by way of, of sort of introduction to give you some sense of perspective of what we're trying to achieve, achieve here. Um, we're going to start with some just opening remarks, maybe some observations by myself and also the other panelists, and then we're going to go into a, a panel uh, discussion, which hopefully I'll be able to, you know, direct some thought-provoking questions at the appropriate parties, and uh, maybe they can share with you some of their uh, insights into just exactly what's happened since 9-11 in, in the law enforcement community. Now. Uh, along those lines, let me just, you know, offer up my personal observations. Back on September 11th, I was the district attorney of Albany County, and, and you know, that day is, is um, uh, you know, one of those generational events. You know, for, for a generation, it was where were you when John Kennedy was assassinated. And everybody can tell you the day and the hour and the moment that they heard. And for, for this generation, for many people today, that 9-11 event was something that no one will ever forget. The images, the, the plane slamming into the building, the loss of life. And it, it, it was a transformative event in the, in the um, history of the country. But I think what it also operated to do was change the way people think about their world and terrorism and what's really going on uh, outside the United States and how it can affect us inside the United States. You know, there was a time when you heard, well, a plane was, was hijacked. And the first thing you would think of, well, they're going to make some demands to, you know, release some political prisoners. They're going to land the plane at some location that they didn't want to be at, but, you know, they'll land the plane safely. There'll be negotiations, and then really it's just going to be a matter of how many hours they sit on the tarmac before they surrender, and it becomes a, a law enforcement operation at that point. No one ever thought at that moment on 9-11 that when a plane was hijacked that it was going to be used as a missile, as a device to commit mass murder. That didn't enter into people's minds. And what happened was when the first plane hit, people said, oh, this must be an accident. And then when the second plane hit, it was obvious that it was not an accident. And because of the communications system that we have now, um, those people on Flight 93 were able to figure out that, you know, on their flight, they were not going to be landing at a remote location and, you know, uh, negotiating demands over political prisoners. Just the opposite. They knew at that moment, probably before anyone else in the country, what kind of a world it was going to be after that day. And so, you know, People's minds and, and, and thoughts changed dramatically. Perspective changed. And law enforcement changed. They had to change. And so 
what we're going to do today, hopefully, is um, maybe try to turn around um, in, in this public forum uh, what exactly the changes are. Um, are they good? Are they bad? Are there, you know, what policies are driving the change? And um, hopefully it'll give everyone some insight into um, just exactly uh, where we are going forward uh, as far as this, you know, fighting, chasing terrorists. So having said that, um, uh, I'm going to go, I suppose, uh, from right to left, because Mr. Hartunian here is uh, um, the U.S. Attorney and is representative of the federal government. And so to the extent that uh, 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 the feds are sort of taking the lead role, uh, although there's going to be some discussion about that, uh, the feds take a lead role in, in terrorism. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hartunian to maybe give you some federal perspective on the post-9-11 world. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, nice to be here. Uh, my name, as Paul said, is Rick Hartunian. I'm the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of New York. Uh, that is a, an area that encompasses half of the state of New York geographically, uh, about 30, uh, 32 counties uh, from above Westchester, starting in Ulster County, all the way up to the Canadian border, out beyond Syracuse toward Auburn, and then down in the southern tier of uh, Binghamton and Broome County. So we have a very large jurisdictional footprint uh, in the Northern District of New York. Uh, notably for this discussion, we have a 300 mile long border. And uh, border security and counterterrorism, I would have to say, is our number one priority as federal prosecutors. Uh, that dovetails with the department's priorities, the number one priority being uh, national security, keeping Americans safe from terrorism, terrorist related acts. So uh, it's something that uh, we spend a lot of time with. I have a large staff, uh, a total of about 48 lawyers. Uh, we have a number of them dedicated uh, as specialists who are specially trained to work in this area. I'm not one of the specially trained lawyers. I uh, actually came up uh, through the system as an assistant U.S. attorney handling narcotics cases. I was a narcotics and violent crime prosecutor uh, before I was appointed as U.S. attorney in January of 2010. So in that capacity, I have some sense of some of the investigative te techniques that are used, how they're used, how, they, how investigations develop, and how they unfold all the way from their inception through trial. And uh, so I can uh, talk a little bit about some of those things that I know and understand. Uh, on a personal note, uh, it was uh, Rick uh, mentioned and alluded to the fact that I have myself a, a personal interest in this issue of terrorism, uh, it's sadly true. Uh, back in, uh, in December of 1988, on December 21st, uh, my sister Lynn, who was a 21-year-old student from the State University of New York at Oswego, was traveling home from London and boarded Pan Am Flight 103. And uh, as all of you know, uh, that plane was blown out of the sky above Lockerbie, Scotland. Uh, and so I have a, a very personal connection and understanding about terrorism. Uh, I've uh, lived with it uh, and with my family uh, tried to take the position that we should figure out a way to survive that horrible event and make something positive come of it. Uh, it's not easy since uh, Pan Am 103 is one of those events like 9-11, like many of the other terrorist events, they seem to constantly recur. And to my shock and dismay today, as I was headed over here, I learned the news that Muammar Gaddafi had uh, been killed, or at least there were reports of that coming out of Libya. So again, this is a story that, uh, as I say to my, my mom, uh, it never goes away. Certainly the pain of losing someone in that kind of horrific event never goes away. So I'm vigilant. I understand it. I have a unique perspective about it. And uh, I hope I can lend something to the discussion today. Thanks, Rick. Um, now, uh, uh, as uh, Rick pointed out, um, Boris Lederer is a, a uh, legit terrorist hunter. And so um, we're going to get his perspective on chasing terrorists, um, first as an overview and then uh, as part of the, uh, the program. Well, 
Good, good afternoon, everybody. I'm not from this part of the world. I'm kind of a little bit further south. Um, I am first generation. I uh, immigrated here from Czechoslovakia at the time, which was a communist country, so I'm a convert. Um, I truly believe in this system, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here and I wouldn't be doing what I am doing. Um, my perspective on terrorism, especially my last about 15 or 20 years, has been as a foot soldier. Not necessarily a policymaker, but somebody who gets to carry out some of the decisions that are made by others. Um, a couple of times, it's gone, a, in my case, it was really a horrible realization of being a self-aware hammer. Um, I'm sure some of you have been in that position before, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, you're a tool, but you kind of know that your, your place in time and space is a little bit above and beyond that. Uh, you try not to create what are, in the DOD terminology, called black swan events. What that means is that a, uh, a fairly insignificant individual can have an impact on the world in either a good or a negative direction. So you kind of try to follow those orders as much as you can. Um, as far as terrorism and such, I usually break it down in my own mind to clear and murky. The clear is any one of us kind of understands that if somebody declares that they're a very bad person and they're going to do very bad things, there's, a, there's really not a question in anybody's mind that that person ought to be taken off the street so that they don't cause harm to themselves or anyone else. That's really an easy easy solution. The more difficult one is the murky portion. And that's where the individual is claiming to be a good person doing good deeds for their particular belief or their particular social group. Uh, that may not necessarily reflect the opinion of everybody else. Um, and that's where that murky area comes in. Um, additionally, I always bring, in, bring into it the, the more current um, life. Most of you folks that are very young probably live at least 40 to 50 percent of your time in the virtual realm. The days of interpersonal connectivity, meaning you have to meet someone in person to actually conduct business, are forever over. A lot of what we're dealing with, especially with the Patriot Act and the discussion that's going to take place, how do you conduct security operations in the world where 50% of our time is spent in the virtual realm. And that is significant because ultimately we all have different personas. Um, I am this person in real life. Who am I on the internet? Who am I in my virtual space? Uh, those are some of the questions that we as a community and we as, as, as voters will have to come up and, and make decisions on and see if the tools that we offer to our security mechanism are the ones that we feel comfortable with and are the adequate ones to protect us, yet still maintain that dignity and, and civil liberty and freedom. I tend to be fairly libertarian in my own personal views as far as my security goes. Um, however, having made a choice to defend the nation and to protect our security, I do understand the requirement for potentially taking my shoes off at the airport or n not saying anything that would make me a, a suspect to a security organization that's been tasked with protecting aviation. Uh, I, I do understand some of those things. I don't think it's a good idea to joke uh, when you're in that line and when you're going through that process. As far as hunting terrorists, I don't know. I've, I've met a bunch of freedom fighters. Uh, some of them we were successful in pulling off the streets so that they would not brandish their particular type of freedom, which I really didn't want because it was neither free nor anything else. It was just pretty much just some crazed ideology. So we can discuss that later in a question time frame. That's uh, now for for some perspective, maybe from a um, state slash local law enforcement. Um, uh, Jim Horton, uh, who, uh, as Rick pointed out, uh, spent uh, 21 years with the state police. He's worked in a prosecutorial agency as well as a, a police agency, and now is uh, with Homeland Security. So for that 
maybe perspective on, on state local law enforcement. Jim? Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, like Rick and Paul said, my uh, previous life was in what I guess you would call regular crime or everyday crime. And in particular, most of my uh, experience was in homicide or major crime. So it was a reactive uh, role that we took. The crime had to happen, and then we'd react to it, investigate it, arrest and prosecute, hopefully. Uh, so I guess I'm here to, to give you that perspective. Uh, back then versus today, uh, law enforcement, how they're trained, what they're doing, boots on the ground, guys. Uh, I have the luxury of having a, uh, my son is a state trooper, a road trooper, and he, uh, he uh, also happens to be an attorney, so he's a deep thinker, I guess. <laughs> well, that's, that's up in the air. <laughs> the jury's still out on that one. <laughs> point, is, point is, he does, you know, he, he, he knows the law very well, and uh, trying to live my life vicariously through him right now. Uh, and right now I'm, I am at the Office of Counterterrorism. My, my duties include, but aren't limited to, uh, liaison on the whole police agency in the state of New York. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's over 590 police departments in the state, uh, and that including federal. Uh, all fire and EMS providers, uh, there's numbers in the thousands, because they need to be our ears and eyes. I, uh, I work with Rick's uh, office a lot. Um, on the state side, we are responsible for any counterterrorism uh, activities on the northern border, which is uh, problematic to say the least. Um, it's an international border, but once they step into New York, it's our problem. Uh, and there is there are problems up there, no doubt about it. Um, so I guess I want to I'm going to talk about doing the discussion. Uh, Proactive versus reactive, how law enforcement has changed from pre 9 11 to today, and how it needs to change more and how it will. Uh, I, I would welcome any questions. We are sort of scripted up here, and I get that. We got together beforehand, uh, we talked about what we're going to talk about. So I would welcome questions by you. You're interested enough to come here on this nice day. Uh, I don't take myself that seriously, but I do, do take my job very seriously. So, thanks. Thanks, uh, Jim. Um, Kevin uh, Louis Brandt is uh, a, a really noted practitioner um, in the Capital District. Um, he does a lot of work in federal court and a lot of work in state court. Um, and he has, uh, you know, some firsthand experience um, in dealing with um, law enforcement agencies um, uh, as an advocate for someone accused of crime after 9-11. And uh, I think he has a unique perspective on sort of the difference between the practice and the interaction with the prosecutors pre-9-11 and uh, post-9-11 in, in cases uh, which arguably have uh, what I would characterize as sort of a terrorism component to them. So uh, Kevin's going to share some, you know, in short form, I guess, at this point, um, you know, so his perspective on the pre-9-11 and post-9-11 um, uh, advocacy uh, on behalf of people charged with crimes. Kevin? Thanks, Paul. Uh, back in the uh, middle of uh, 2004, I fairly well developed uh, federal practice and got a phone call from a magistrate judge. I was in Boston. Magistrate judge is a judge in, sitting in Albany who called me and asked me if I wanted to ruin my career, and I said I'd be happy to. Uh, he asked me to accept uh, somebody accused of uh, money laundering in connection with a terrorist, uh, terrorist acts and a conspiracy, and I agreed to do it and did it with a lawyer named Terry Kinlan. He represented one defendant, and uh, they, the uh, it, it was a, a prominent case to the extent that we learned uh, what, what the, the fellows to my right, who I have so much regard and respect for, they know everything that's behind the curtain that um, I didn't know and I couldn't learn in, in our case. And the difference that we learned during the course of uh, litigation after 9-11 was how difficult it has now become or, or became 
to get information to help a defendant charged with a crime. And our case was particularly acute because it was on the really the business end of this proactive uh, investigative techniques that were being used. It was people who were not engaged in crimes uh, and that they were induced, and the government acknowledged they were induced in a sting operation to commit crimes and then were arrested for those crimes. And it did not, according to the jury and according to uh, the, the judge that presided over the case, right up until the U.S. Supreme Court concluded it was not uh, uh, entrapment. It was a, uh, a lesser form of it, and the fellows we represented ended up serving and are serving 15-year sentences for terrorism-related activities. But what th the most important thing that we learned from the case was how far we had to go to try to figure out what the government had on our clients uh, to the point where we really didn't see what they had, but would go to the courthouse and on the roofs across the street would be men with machine guns and the streets would be blocked off and there was double security. And we could never quite figure out why because of a lot of the provisions of law that protect that information uh, in order to protect us. That's the, what the information was designed to do. It was all done according to law, laws that you know, we disagreed with in representing our clients. And uh, it was a process, uh, uh, a learning process, because it really changed how the federal courts had always worked. I'd done lots of work with Rick Hartunian, who I had a great relationship with and still do. He didn't, he didn't work on that case. But the, the files would always be open. You'd always know what the charges were and what facts there were against your client. And this was the, the beginning of the process now that exists, I believe, where it's really hard to figure out what is against your client, which makes it hard to represent your client and creates uh, suspicions that uh, maybe are warranted and maybe aren't warranted. All right, now what we're going to do is, um, uh, to the extent that uh, chronologically, um, you know, we've talked about pre-9-11 versus post-9-11, we're going to do a little pre-9-11 to try to get some perspective on, on, you know, where law enforcement's collective head was at uh, on uh, the 10th of September uh, 2001. So, um, why don't, again, we'll, we'll maybe start with, with Rick. Um, uh, what do you feel was um, law enforcement uh, cr primary criminal focus prior to 9/11? Um, you know, at the international level, at the federal level, and even down into the state and local level. Well, as you know, because you worked with me, um, we were at the district attorney's office uh, pre-9/11. Uh, and uh, at some point in the 90s, uh, primarily we, Paul and I worked there as assistant district attorneys and we were involved in violent crime cases. That's really what monopolized the time of local prosecutors. Paul handled uh, murder cases, I handled narcotics cases, um, uh, violent crime cases, uh, you know, some fraud cases periodically we would, we would see come into the office. But uh, generally uh, we were in a very reactive mode. And uh, it was a rare situation, certainly on the local level, where we got involved in an investigation that kind of unfolded that we played some role in. Uh, I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office in 1997 uh, and became an assistant United States attorney uh, and continued my work as a narcotics prosecutor there. Uh, interestingly, the work of a federal prosecutor is much different than the work of a state prosecutor in this major respect. Uh, federal prosecutors get involved in investigations at an early stage. They're typically uh, presented with a case that is unfolding. Uh, they may meet with agents from a federal agency, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the FBI, or the ATF, and uh, be given information uh, uh, and work with the uh, special agents from those agencies, and then come up with an investigative plan. And uh, as a prosecutor, I like that system better because I could play some role in designing the case, if you will, in, and in working with the agency to develop the evidence that I knew I was going to have to use to A, indict the case, and then B, bring the case to trial and convict the defendant. And uh, so not surprisingly, we, uh, we have that luxury in, in uh, the federal world. And, uh, and we, we did that uh, pre-9-11, I think, uh, pr pretty effectively. Uh, so our focus in terms of our priorities were, I think, similar. Uh, violent crime, drug-related crime. And uh, we, we spent uh, a, a lot of resources and a lot of effort working those kinds of investigations. 
we try to uh, target or drug organizations, uh, groups, uh, drug trafficking organizations that were um, handling large quantities of cocaine or marijuana or crack cocaine. Uh, some of the cases I worked on were tied to uh, Colombian drug cartels and uh, New York City drug organizations and Canadian drug organizations. Uh, we've always dealt, as I said, with our northern border here in the northern district of New York. And uh, uh, the fact that uh, there's free travel between Canada and the U.S. Uh, and a, and a uh, reservation, uh, the Aquasasne Indian Reserve up uh, on our border, creates great challenges for law enforcement. And those challenges existed pre-9-11 and still exist today. You know, as an aside, because you mentioned, you know, we worked together in the DA's office, and he, he was a, um, um, a drug prosecutor, and I was prosecuting homicide cases. <coughs> Excuse me. If someone came to me with a case that involved um, a, a, a foreign national from some Middle Eastern country uh, who had a forged driver's license, and someone said, here, you, you, you should prosecute this case. I would have taken that file and thrown it back in their face and said, you know, what are you, out of your mind? This is so far beneath me. And yet we know from 9-11 that the individuals involved in that attack could not have performed a lot of the things that they had to perform in order to set it up unless they had fake driver's licenses, fake identifications. And, you know, that is something that, again, pre- 9-11, you know, it just didn't have the cachet that, you know, a homicide case would or a big drug case involving, you know, a Colombian drug cartel. It just, you know, it was not, um, wasn't a front burner thing. And, and you know, that's just my observation because you, you pointed that out that uh, at the time, the things that maybe, uh, peak your interest may not be the things that are the most important from a law enforcement perspective. So, uh, Boris? <clears throat> My world was slightly different. At that time, I was brand new retiree out of the military and I was working on a project for anti-terrorism force protection for the Navy at the, uh, the Navy code called N34, which is the anti-terrorism force protection code. Uh, we had the USS Cole get attacked a few months prior to that, and also the uh, the U.S. embassies were bombed prior to that as well. So, in my world, we were actually fairly aware of an impending operation. All of the U.S. military bases, all U.S. personnel on September 10 were at the highest level of alert outside of an actual shooting war. We just didn't know where it was coming from and what was going to happen. Um, so that's basically where it stood for about a week prior is where the, uh, where the force protection level uh, was elevated to that higher level uh, internationally. Um, however, DOD, Department of Defense being what it is, it tends to function fairly cyclically as well. And the anti-terrorism force protection project within the Navy itself started off under it, the immediate sort of impact of the USS Cole, and it was uh, it was spearheaded by a two-star admiral. By the time that I was involved in the progress, it was controlled by a commander who was very capable. He handed it off to a Navy lieutenant who was also very capable, and on 9-10, it was in the hands of a very capable, unpaid summer volunteer intern. So that's where the Navy's anti-terrorism force protection was on 9-10. Um, on 9-12, it was right back in the hands of a two-star admiral, and, uh, and it elevated and escalated from that point on. Um, my previous life prior to that was hunting down at that point primarily what we were terming pifwicks, which were persons or people indicted of war crimes. And that kind of, it, it spilled over into the entire spectrum. We were looking for folks in Rwanda, we were looking for folks in Europe, we were looking for folks in South America, pretty much wherever guys were hiding who were indicted uh, by The Hague for various uh, war crimes out there. We had some levels of success in that arena, but once again, there were enough 
signatures and signs even on the very basic low ground level that we should have seen already back then that there was something else taking place in the background. Operations in Bosnia, there was quite a few times where we were running into what then would be the Al-Qaeda guys. And we just never really, it, it didn't make the connection at that time. It was kind of like what you were saying to where, yes, if we were a little bit better at catching those guys at that point, we probably could have prevented some of the escalation of violence that we're having to deal with right now. Now, I, I, along those lines, and, and, and maybe I will save this question for later on, but uh, you indicated that um, 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 you were involved in, in sort of international war crimes. Um, in, in, your, in your experience, um, do you have in your own mind a, a definition for someone who is a terrorist as opposed to someone who may have committed you know, a crime against a people? Is there a difference? Do you see a difference? It's, it's murky at best is the short answer. Um, however, when, when I was looking at various acts committed by some of these folks, in my mind, let's say, the Al-Qaeda example of terrorism to me is a terrorist activity. There is really no legitimacy behind anything that, that those attackers did. Take over an airplane, capture a bunch of people hostage, and fly the airplane into a ground target and kill a bunch more people. That really, you know, there's really, it, I am sure that in their minds they were trying to do it for greater glory, what have you. I, I, I'm sure there were all kinds of reasons. But that was really an act of terror. What Rick was describing earlier, I still can't go to Oklahoma City and not cry like a little baby. It, it, it really had that kind of an impact. I think the punishment that McWay got was way too lenient. Um, however, he, that to me is a clear example of terror. Uh, whereas a war crime is the, the complicity of an elected leader who says nothing and turns a blind eye and allows the police or the military to start gathering people up and throwing them in, in, into a mine shaft and then flooding the mine shaft with sulfuric acid. Those are just some of the examples we were having to deal with. Now that, to me, yes, that person didn't do it to cause terror per se, but they were complicit in the fact that they allowed it to happen. I, I don't know if that's a good enough sort of example. I, I, I don't I, know that there's necessarily good enough or not good enough. But, but I, I sort it out that way, kind of. Yeah, I mean, to, so for, from your perspective, you you can at least you know, try and maybe draw some distinction between um, what a, quote, terrorist is as opposed to some other type of bad person. Yes. Yes, that would be the short answer. All right. Well, we're going to come back to that in a little while. Uh, Jim, uh, pre-9-11 law enforcement focus, you are a, a major, you're, you're the, the head of the Major Crimes Bureau of the New York State Police, Troop G, uh, and you have a lot on your plate. What are you thinking about? Not terrorism. Uh, terrorism to me, and I think I can speak for everybody in law enforcement pre-9-11, was terrorism to me, the first word pop into my head would be overseas or international. Uh, I did not, and I was well aware of the USS Cole, well aware of uh, Tanzania and uh, Kenya, the bombings at the embassy, uh, the 1993 World Trade Center, which was on our soil, uh, it still seemed not my area of expertise, well, certainly not my area of expertise, not my job. Somebody else was taking care of that. We were taking care of the everyday crime. You know, your police officers, your investigators, your detectives were trying to keep up with the normal crime, as you know. Uh, so, but I don't want to get open bogged down in a word or a, a, with semantics and words here. Is a terrorist a criminal? Is a criminal a terrorist? 
Yeah, terrorist is definitely criminal, but not all criminals are terrorists. So then you got to identify what a terrorist actually is. Is Timothy McVeigh a terrorist? I remember when it happened. I know where I was. Uh, my first thought was somebody from overseas. My last thought was that it was an American citizen. And then, funny, I, I felt he's just a bad he's a criminal. He's, you know, he needs to for what he did. He's, he's a criminal. The terrorist didn't fit my mindset. And I agree with Boris that you know executing him was too good. He, you know, I had a, a thought on that. I'll talk to you offline. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't, not the way you think. It just should have left him in a cell with nothing for the rest of his natural life. But uh, yeah, a lot of my plate in terrorism was someone else's job. It wasn't going to hit our shores. Even though 93 did, or WTC, but, uh, you know, I, when it comes back to me, when I talk about today, I can certainly tell you how my mind has changed towards terrorism and the word terrorist uh, today. Well, why don't you pick that up as a follow-up? Well, a, a, a terrorist, you know, they broke through our seal, obviously. Uh, when I was doing major crimes, uh, it was generally homicides. It was, like I said earlier, it was reactive. The crime had to happen, generally. The only proactive uh, investigations we did were narcotics. I dabbled in narcotics because a lot of our homicides were narcotic related. Uh, but we didn't think like we think today. And like I mentioned earlier, and I, I talked to my son a lot about this, and I grabbed him yesterday, and I said, now as a police officer, boots on the ground, right here in New York State, what is your daily routine? Of course, he's got, he's responsible for traffic accidents and domestic complaints and burglaries and the normal crime, but then he does, he reaches out to the community, a lot of community outreach, uh, safeguard, if you, you may have not, you may not know what that is, where he reaches out to businesses, you know, pre-9-11, someone going to a beauty salon and ordering up a bunch of hydrogen peroxide was not suspicious. Today it is. And along with 100 other sectors, pool chemicals, pool companies. I never stopped at a pool company and asked them how much chlorine they were selling when I was a trooper. But now the police today are, are tasked with that. And terrorism is on their mind today. Uh, we've got a ways to go, but um, it is part of their training, their education, and their daily vocabulary. Where it wasn't with me. And if I wasn't sitting here, or, you know, if I had another job, or whatever it may be, it wouldn't be part of my life either. But since I work here, uh, it is. And I can see where the law enforcement has changed for the good. Uh, if that makes you feel any better, uh, and I'm just a bean counter, but uh, you know, we make sure that law enforcement boots on the ground in the community, you people, the public, keep your eyes and ears open. We did community policing back pre-9-11, and we're still doing it now. And, but we need the public more than ever. The guy next door, the, 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 your fellow student, your fellow worker, your neighbor, uh, these are the people, because now it's, it's homegrown. It's happening within our, our walls. That's the way they do it now, because it's so hard to move a cell. We put up roadblocks. And so they've, they've adapted. It's, you know, who builds a better mousetrap? Right. So, I kind of took off here. Sorry. Well, that's a, well. It's sort of what, what I'd like to do, maybe, is is you know segue that into um, what, and and I'm going to direct this uh, first to Boris, then to Mr. Hartunian. Um, um, what do you feel has been the most significant structural change in in um, uh, uh, pursuing terrorism intelligence since 9-11? Wow, that's a tough one, um, and especially at my level. So it, basically, I'm the third or fourth step removed. I, I would like to caveat that. Um, in my opinion, it was probably the chartering and the organization within the DOD of Joint Special Operations Command Okay, why don't you maybe, for, for those of us who uh, are not completely familiar with the structure of the Department of Defense, maybe you could elaborate on that. Right, basically, and in a nutshell, just like any other organization, the military 
operates within particular behavioral areas and they don't tend to spill out of them. Uh, the con construct of joint special operations allowed, and I once again, I'm speaking way outside of my comfort zone here, uh, it allowed for a creation of a flexible enough force within the Department of Defense to be able to assist with prosecution of terrorism globally. Not necessarily preventively, but globally, meaning if we do have a problem in a country that today is as stable as it gets, is there someone who is capable of, if tomorrow that country turns not so stable, can we respond there? Can we actually <coughs> assist? Uh, it, it would be to that degree. And the creation of JSOC was probably the, the, the sort of the, the key component in the real terms. Of, of people doing the work. The so actual... Internationally. R internationally, and I believe at a certain point, just the, the ability to, to transfer some of that international expertise and offer it to the domestic uh, law enforcement or to the domestic response community, meaning in an advisory role. Hey, you know, we've already uh, developed an SOP that assists us with these kinds of things. Is it useful to you? the law enforcement uh, I mean, in, in those areas. Rick, uh, as far as uh, federally, what, what, what do you think is, has been the most significant structural change that uh, came as a result of 9-11? Uh, uh, I think it's the law enforcement counterpart to this uh, joint operations idea. And I, I would say that uh, we use the term fusion centers. Uh, fusion centers are something that really didn't exist. And Jimmy, you know, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Back in the day, before 9/11, uh, we had uh, we, we operated under a task force concept once in a while. But this concept of fusion centers is a post 9/11 phenomenon. That uh, I think the data would, if you would read it, would would suggest to you that in maybe 05 or 06 there were a handful of them. And I think there's more than 70 now around the country. We have one of the flagship fusion centers right here in the state of New York, the New York State Intelligence Center, the NYSIC, as we call it. And uh, it, is, it is a physical location where uh, many uh, officers and agents come together and they actually gather and disseminate intelligence. That's something that didn't happen prior to 9-11, uh, obviously. When, when you say gather and disseminate mm -hmm. intelligence, now, it, it, it is, is, is there intelligence being pushed from the top down, or is there intelligence being pushed from the bottom up? Uh, you know, and who are the stakeholders in, in, in the, the whole fusion notion? I think the intelligence comes from a whole bunch of different sources. I think it comes uh, uh, sometimes from the intelligence community uh, after it's been developed. Uh, I think it comes from uh, all the different agencies that are out there. And what it does is allow, it allows analysts to kind of gather, gather the information together and to make some sense of it, to send out alerts and to send out information and to increase the level of communication. It's also a resource that investigators who are working cases can use to turn to and try and develop information uh, uh, that's out there. So, um, you know, these fusion centers are a, a, big, a big deal and they're operating around the country and uh, you know, the federal government's actively involved in them. The other thing that I think was a, a very big development uh, led by the FBI is the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. Again, a task force idea uh, where groups of agents uh, at the local, state, federal, and in some cases the tribal uh, level, even some of the tribal PDs, and we have very good relations with our tribal uh, PD partners up on the Aquasasne, uh, uh, come together and actually work cases jointly. Uh, investigate cases, participate in investigations, and track uh, track information down. And so those are uh, new developments, post 9-11 developments, that I think are a big deal. Jim, state? It, it goes both ways. The information comes in from the, the public through the uh, Safe New York Tips line, which uh, who cares what that means or what the number is, call 911 if you see something suspicious. Uh, that means the information will come in and it will go to the fusion center, it will be analyzed, it will be, you know, uh, looked at, checked all the, the databases which pre-9-11 there were no uh, 
databases together. You know, this was not TV cop business where you just put a name in and up pops uh, all this information. There's privacy issues uh, back then and, and now, which Kevin, I'm sure, will probably want to discuss or talk about. But um, the information will come in. It'll go up the, up the flag and come down. If it's credible, if it needs more work, they'll assign it to a, a person or the, the Quick says the JTTF, test, Joint Terrorism Task Force. Uh, so there is a system in place today to take tips and you know not just have one person say, that eh, doesn't sound credible. There's checks and balances, and I know in the audience here we have some of our analysts from the NYSIC, uh, who when we get the back and forth would be happy to uh, tell you how that works to a point. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it, information flows both ways. Pre-9-11, uh, unfortunately and embarrassingly, it didn't work that way. Uh, there were a lot of what they referred to as silos or stove pipes, and a lot of holding things close to your vest. Uh, I saw that in narcotics because my informant, you didn't want to lose your informant. But now, uh, hopefully, the egos have been you know, set aside, and the fusion centers are the vehicle to get this information, connect the dots. A lot of work to do. You know, there's, there's a lot of dots to connect. What do you connect? It's very hard, uh, you know, to put a tip coming out of the UK into the state of Wyoming and then down to Florida and back and forth. And uh, it's, it's not easy working. The analysts, uh, I, I give them all credit uh, that they deserve. So things are much better than they were. I think I can tell you that for sure. So. <clears throat> You got, you know, a tool in the toolbox, the Fusion Center, okay? And so I'm going to talk about another tool in the toolbox that some people say it's not a tool, it's a weapon. Um, other people say it's a great tool, uh, and that's the USA Patriot Act. And uh, there was a lot of controversy surrounding its, its uh, passage. Um, um, I distinctly recall, um, you know, the debate when the librarians, the librarians against the Patriot Act came out hard against the Patriot Act. Um, and, you know, who's going to argue with librarians, right? Um, you know, obviously that's, there's something wrong here, right? And there was a lot of uh, debate and it was passed. And then some of its provisions um, uh, went into effect. Um, there were many people who, who you know, uh, basically uh, condemned the, the act. Uh, and then last year, uh, President Obama uh, signed legislation to extend certain provisions of the Patriot Act for a year. And in 2011, it's been extended through June 1st, 2015. Um, what I'd like maybe Mr. Hartunian to do, if he could, um, maybe share with us uh, some of his thoughts on uh, uh, what the Patriot Act uh, does and perhaps what it doesn't do. Well, I, I, I don't think it changes some of the basic investigative techniques that we've used and we continue to use, but it did certainly do something very important that Jim alluded to, and that is, I think, lowering the wall that existed between the intelligence community and the law enforcement community. There had previously been really uh, a, a stovepiping of information and uh, not significant or sufficient interaction and exchange of information that would allow intelligence information, for example, to find its way into the law enforcement community and be acted upon in some way. That always presented great challenges, I think, with sources and with methods uh, by which the information was obtained. But um, uh, the wall was taken down with the Patriot Act. I think that was probably the most significant uh, change uh, there were other changes as well. Uh, one of the things uh, I think that came into vogue with the Patriot Act is the concept of roving surveillance. This was another idea that uh, uh, is, is now uh, used and probably a little more mainstream. Uh, that, that is surveillance of a particular target as opposed to a particular communications device or facility as, as the legal term is that we use. And, and there has to be certainly sufficient showings uh, to use these tools, but uh, the Patriot Act, I think, recognize it. We, well, have to, we have to modernize some of our investigative technique because 
uh, the terrorists are using more modern technology. They're well, using throwaway maybe telephones. For the benefit like of, of some of the audience, when you say a roving wiretap mm -hmm. targeting a person as opposed to a device, do, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, that's exactly what the order allows, and that is when, a, when a, someone is shown to be trying to thwart the discovery of their surveillance device uh, and, and uh, who is someone who is maybe frequently changing phones or using throwaway telephones uh, or carriers or providers. Uh, it allows the interception to be of the, per of the person and, and what it does is uh, prevents there from being significant delay in trying to figure out, for example, what the next telephone is, if the telephone number is, for example, that the person has been using. So the agent wouldn't have to go back and get a new warrant right, they would have for have, that particular they phone. Have, they would have made a showing that um, this is this is what the target, for example, has been doing. I mean, there has to be a showing made, and uh, be allowed to target the, whatever facility that the uh, prospective defendant will be using. As you sit so that's here, that's a, a, kind of an example. As you sit here today, do you know whether or not there's been uh, a challenge to that uh, authority? Um, I, I, I would expect there w would be. Uh, the technique's been used. Wiretap tech, uh, orders uh, and applications are frequently challenged in federal court, and I can't give an example offhand. Well, uh, l let me ask you this. There's been some, some like I said, the, the librarians against the Patriot Act, um, that uh, there's somehow this notion that um, the government can just uh, um, you know, access um, uh, individuals reading materials to find out whether or not they're, you know, reading pernicious material. Um, did the did the um, Patriot Act operate as some kind of a change in the process? I, I, I'd be surprised if the government, you know, agents went into libraries and started uh, flipping through Dewey Decimal uh, systems uh, just kind of at random. I mean. Uh, knowing what I know about the operation of federal law enforcement, we uh, typically have a s significant predication before we commence an investigation. There's some reason, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we, like you know, all agencies, have limited resources. We don't have a limitless l supply of resources. Uh, the agents with whom I work uh, and have experience with are responsible and want to do their jobs responsibly, and so. Um, I, you know, it, what's interesting is, and we were talking about this earlier, uh, even, even pre-Patriot Act, you could probably get information from a library with some of the traditional techniques that we use. Like a subpoena? Like a grand jury subpoena. Uh, or a, an interview, perhaps. Uh, typically, an agent might go and interview a librarian and get somebody to voluntarily provide information. So um, anyway, that's... Uh, so it, 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 do, you, do you think that the... Um Patriot Act uh, operated to significantly change the way law enforcement conducted its investigations? Well, I think that it gave law enforcement significant tools. There's no question about it. And, uh, you know, in recognition of the uh, great threat that we face, uh, as I said, I had kind of realized it pre-9-11, but uh, post-9-11, the country and Congress realized that we have to take significant steps to uh, lower the wall between the intelligence community and law enforcement community, to beef up our resources in that regard, to allow some of these more modernized <coughs> surveillance tools that take into account more modern surveillance or more modern um, communications developments. And uh, I think that it was for that reason that it came about. Kevin, you have firsthand experience defending an individual charged with a terrorism-related crime. Um, uh, do you know whether or not in that particular case there was evidence that was gathered pursuant to provisions of the Patriot Act? Yeah, there, there was. We knew that there was, and we couldn't get at what it was. But um, w one of the things, you know, sitting with these, these fellas and just knowing their background, you feel so much safer knowing uh, that they're out protecting us. I, you feel that as a citizen. That said, since 9-11, there's really only been one or two terrorist-related cases in this district. Really, that's all there's really been. Uh, I had one. There was one in Syracuse. Rick may know of another one or two, but there weren't that many cases. And at any one point in time, 
uh, I mean, and Rick pointed, Rick Cartunia pointed to the border, and we have a, a dreadful border that has uh, hundreds and hundreds of border points, and at any point in time, I'll have uh, 10 or 12 pending huge drug cases. I mean, 21 keys of uh, cocaine, heroin, you name it, uh, we have it. And that's almost a regular thing. And, and uh, I guess I'd be interested in if, if a, whether a lot of the intelligence work that's going on is gathering information that might be advancing those cases other than just uh, protecting us from the big incident that might cause harm to all of us that everyone's fearful of and remembers. Uh, and I think because we, we, we in the case, as, as uh, Paul was alluding to, the whole dynamic of handling cases that involve Patriot Act, it changed everything on how we do practice law down in the federal court on well, those type you, cases. Well, earlier when we were prepping, we were, you were telling about your, your experience um, um, and, and what you were required oh, yeah. to do in order to get information which in a regular prosecution I assume you would get by sending a letter to the US attorney right we used to we sit down with the US attorney in this case we had to get a security clearance it took nine months to get I had to give my tax returns my neighbors are interviewed my na neighbor's neighbor who didn't like me gets interviewed uh, you know and you go through this whole process nine months they build an office uh, secure building a uh, secure room in the federal courthouse just for us one for me one for the other lawyer and they built this, uh, they brought in a secure uh, cabinet with a combination on it. And anytime I went, I'd have to go with a, a guy from Washington. I'd have to call this guy up from Washington. He'd fly out, and we go to the door. We unlock the door together. We go in. We do the combination. We open it up, and there was one piece of paper in there. That was, it. That was what was in there. That's what they were hiding from us. It took nine months to do, and that was the... Uh, um, and that, that was this behind the curtain process that we didn't know what was there. And you get this sense, this foreboding sense for nine months, we're going through this process, this is terrible, it's super secret. Oh my God, what are we gonna see when we go in there? And then you look at a piece of paper that's redacted even. You know, there's only a, a paragraph in the whole paper. And I had to sign a document that if I reveal it that I'm you know, committing treason. I can't even tell what we, was we, in we it. We don't want you to reveal anything here today. But that's, okay. but that, it's kind of that, um, that mindset that gets you kind of, uh, I don't know, sometimes misdirected, I think we kind of get. And, and uh, you know, Rick has made great strides on gang uh, drug cases. I mean, monstrous uh, strides in the city of Albany and Syracuse um, that, uh, that's done a lot. I don't know if there's a lot of resources went into that that, that may have been gone, have, have gone to or been utilized in the, in the terrorism fight. And, and that's really made an impact, a huge impact, I think, in the streets of Albany and other places. Well, in connection with your experience, um, um, what was the stated justification to you from the government as to why this information should not be made available to you? They, they don't tell you. I mean, this, this is how obscene the process is. Now I'm getting going. Um, <laughs> well, that's my job. I'm, I'm, <laughs> the, the, the government acquires information using uh, warrantless uh, eavesdropping. What they do is, what they're allowed to do in the Patriot Act, some provisions is, uh, they, uh, they don't have to go to a judge, they can get a wiretap. They get information on the wiretap, then they go to the judge, and they go over with the judge whether they're going to reveal it to us, and we're not in the room. The defense attorneys aren't in the room. You can you imagine trying to defend somebody and their Sixth Amendment right to counsel, and you're not allowed in the room when they're talking about whether the information's going to come out? And here, our argument was, Kinlan and I, hey, we signed we have maximum security clearances. We're both former Army guys who had security clearances. And we're swearing that they were, uh, you know, on our lives we won't release the information. Let us come in the room, see what you got, and we'll debate whether it comes out. Why should we rely upon the government's agent and, and, and uh, good faith people from Rick's office, great people who I really like, in with a judge who I really like, but they're deciding without the adversary system of, of lawyers fighting to get to the truth or to get to information, that, that went puff with uh, both the Patriot Act and what's called the Classified Information Procedures Act, which limits information and access to information. You put those two together and defense people who are in the bullseye on uh, terrorist-related cases, and that's a really broad term, 
uh, they're, in, they're in trouble because they, they, they sit there and they shake and they say, I didn't do anything and I can't find out what it is alleged I did as to why there's, gun, there's gunmen on the building and the streets are blocked off and everyone's looking at me like I have two heads and I don't know why. And that's, you know, that's part of that whole, um, that's the frustration from uh, the defense attorney side representing a, a, a person, a human being. All right. Um, um, there's a question here, and um, I have to make a comment. <laughs> I'm going to let you make a comment in a moment. No, I'm going to make one right now. <laughs> let me just say, I mean, uh, and Kevin and I are, are good friends. You may be surprised to know, and have actually uh, worked many cases together. And and uh, there's no more zealous advocate or anyone for whom I have greater respect than Kevin uh, Louis Brand. But. Um, I have to respectfully disagree with his characterization of the process. He used words like hiding and behind the curtain and obscene. I think those are kind of inflammatory words. I think Kevin would concede that uh, the government in this case followed the rules of the uh, SEPA Act, the Classified Information Procedure Act, uh, which provided for the process that, that uh, the lawyers who prosecuted that case undertook. And it provided for a review by the uh, trial judge, uh, the, the district court judge, the Article III lifetime judge. It provided uh, for uh, a, a balancing of whether the information is of a national security nature, whether the revelation of the information would somehow cause harm to national security. So there's a necessary balancing that has to be done, I think, that is addressed in the, in the SEPA Act. And that act was followed, and I'll point out that not only did Judge McAvoy make the determination that it was appropriately followed, but the Second Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals reviewed the case and reviewed the uh, material in the record and agreed and upheld the conviction on appeal. So uh, I understand Kevin's frustration at the, sometimes some parts of the process, uh, but uh, we followed the law. Well, uh, and to get down sort of to brass tacks here, because this was my next question, which actually it was good that you, you, you know, interceded there for a moment, because I'm going to ask this question. As a, as a matter of policy, Kevin, do you think the Patriot Act goes too far? I'm not uh, an activist in any respect, but I believe that when someone obtains the right in law enforcement to listen to your telephone conversations that they need probable cause to believe that you're engaged in criminal activity and they need to pass that in front of a judge. And when they can do that freely without a warrant, without a judge looking at it, and can listen to conversations, then you're on a slippery slope and, uh, and the slippery slope slipped right into my client and sent him to jail for 15 years in part, not completely. That wasn't the reason he went to jail. Um, we went for worse reasons than that, what the government did to him. But, uh, the, the, uh, but that, the, the point is that uh, that's, that's what they're allowed to do under the Patriot Act. That's what the government, law enforcement, is permitted to do. Uh, and we're left with trusting the good faith of the people who we are assigning and giving that power. And that's what we're doing. All right. I think we know where you stand on that. I've never used Patriot Act. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there were, um, I, I'll make one other comment. You go right ahead. We'll put that to bed. But, uh, you know, Kevin points to some, you know, secret uh, reasons behind that case. There were reasons that were spelled out in court uh, about how that case unfolded. Uh, one of which was a, a phone number uh, of uh, one of the defendants in that case, Mr. Areff, being found at a terrorist training camp uh, with a 518 number. And so we can debate the relevance of that. But I mean, I think the record would show that there's, there were unclassified reasons. I think Judge McAvoy even charged the jury that there were reasons for the government's pursuit of that case. And that, that was probably a charge that you had some argument with. But uh, nonetheless, it was, it, it was given and upheld on appeal. Yeah, you know, we promise not to get twisted around this See, case. Kevin and I, guys, we are, you know, <laughs> Kevin, these guys are, these, Kevin guys and know I, way, uh, these two guys know way more than us. But I'm not going to let that go. Listen, a terrorist training camp. Listen to this. 
the Kurds, the Kurds in Iraq were allies with the Americans against Saddam Hussein. A group of Kurds was going home as the war was winding down, and they were mistaken for enemies. And the 82nd Airborne wiped them out. 92 people, all dead, no survivors. They go in there, and they find a notebook. And the notebook's got a number of this guy, a ref from Niskayuna, who then lived in Albany, and it said he was a commander. That's how it was interpreted in the field. The Army intelligence guy picks it up. He says, this guy's a commander. They say he's in, in Al-Qaeda. He's a commander in Al-Qaeda. He's hiding in Albany. Oh, my God. They send it. They begin the sting operation. They whack our guys. And then, after they arrest them, they realize it was the wrong language. They were thought it was Arabic. That's what the military intelligence guy thought in, on the ground. It wasn't Arabic. It was Kurdish. And the word in Kurdish meant Mr. So Mr. Aref lived here and knew a guy, because he was a Kurd too, and it was his friend who got killed, and it was his notebook. But they thought they had a commander. So there. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right then. Um, and I'm not going to let that go. I'm not going to belabor it either, because these, <laughs> right. right. these guys know yeah. are, are much more versed. Uh, Kevin, uh, I, you know, I, Kevin knows I was not on the prosecution team. Uh, Kevin made these arguments and, and uh, did so passionately, and our side was well represented as well, and they were aired out, uh, heard before Judge McAvoy, and reviewed in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And uh, the case was affirmed on appeal. But in any event, I appreciate your passion, Kevin. Now, to sort of maybe, um, we're going to move into a, the next phase, but, you know, as sort of like a wrap-up. Um, uh, I'll go again, I'll start with Mr. Hartunian to my left, and just go down the line. Um, your sense, your impression, your evaluation of um, uh, where we are today, better, worse, um, prepared, unprepared, um, where are we? 10 years after 9-11 in terms of the security of the citizenry of the United States? I think we're more aware. I think law enforcement is working uh, much better. I think we've engaged the public. I kind of wish back in 1988 we had uh, kind of realized some of these things. Uh, there's public awareness out there, and the government's been active with the Department of Homeland Security and uh, some of the folks down in New York with the See Something, Say Something campaign. That's been uh, put out there, and I think to great result. People are looking around and observing their surroundings and, and reporting problems to law enforcement, and law enforcement is tuned into the fact that there are people who want to do us harm. Uh, the troopers on the ground and the beat cops, they're looking for this kind of information. They're passing it on to a, uh, to a fusion center, ultimately, to a, a, a body, to a law enforcement entity that knows how to disseminate information. And uh, that is a dramatic change, and I think a very, very positive change. I think the other thing that's a, a very positive is engagement with the community. You know, this idea of community policing. And Jimmy said, you know, we were doing it back then. I think we're doing it more now. I think we're doing it more in a better manner. We are engaging the, the community. We engage the community on gangs and drugs. We uh, go into the schools. Jimmy's been with me on some of our projects when we've gone in and talked to some of the students about staying away from gang violence. We've talked to the Arab and Muslim community and uh, told them that we want to partner with them in our law enforcement efforts, and we've had great results with that. Uh, the leaders uh, of uh, some of the local mosques I met with recently with the FBI, all very, very positive people, and uh, all share our concerns that we want to uh, keep America safe and uh, avoid problems with those who would do us harm. So I think that these are really positive developments. I'm encouraged as someone who has been through it personally, has had to live with the horror of the effects of terrorism. Uh, are we perfect? No. Do we make mistakes periodically? Yeah, I think we probably do and may continue to, but we hope to minimize them. Uh, we hope to have respect for people's rights. That's how we in law enforcement, we're actually concerned about that. Some people might not realize that, but we are. We're careful about our work. We want to comply with the rules, comply with the laws. We use the tools that Congress gives us, and uh, we train our lawyers well on them, and we work hard to, to keep the American people safe and to do our jobs well. I think on my end, I'm going to read, just to remind myself, it's uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act. That's USA Patriot Act, just in case there's anyone in here who 
Connor wasn't aware of that. I'm sure everybody was. Um, I would like to offer the following, and these are just my own personal observations. Any riot anywhere on the planet can be quelled almost immediately if I have a shoebox of green cards that I can issue to the participants of that riot right then and there. Because everybody wants to come here. This is still the shining beacon of hope and light in a world of darkness. I, I, I state that as a first-hand experience. Usually, if you can pull out that shoebox and go, hey, look, and if you guys quiet down, line up, war is over. You know, line quiets down, people line up, and, and the process to come over here and become a new citizen starts to take place. Uh, that is the reality, so please, you know, don't ever question uh, the, what we have over here as being that good. It really is. And those, my, those are my observations, and I've spent an awful lot of my adult life living in some of those darker places. Um, I would also offer that there are people out there that instead of working on joining us in the 21st century are actively working on bringing us back into the 6th century. Uh, once again, that's something that, that we're going to have to grapple with. And, and my assumption is, is that on one end, I don't want to sacrifice any civil liberty that I have because it is almost impossible, if not impossible, to gain it back. I think all of us are probably in violent agreement with that. The negative side of it is how do you defend against 50% virtual world, 50% real world without having tools such as the USA Patriot Act so that you can, as a law enforcement or as a security individual, so that you can instead of having to get a permission to track each individual thing, you can now go, okay, hey, look, this guy is a bad individual. We know he's a bad individual. Let's see where that takes us. Um, not being a lawyer, I, I, I'm always in that kind of hmm category, meaning is there a potential for misuse of that? Yes, obviously there is. But is it an incredible tool in the meantime by righteous people? Yes. Yes, it is. And I think, you know, I'd hate to stand over a coffin of a loved one that we could have prevented their, their death. Yeah, that's... All right. Jim? I just learned today that USA Patriot Act is an acronym, and I should have known better. The feds can't do anything without an acronym. Um, very interesting. Um, I, I agree with what uh, Rick said, and I don't want to repeat it. And uh, you know, you mentioned uh, see something, say something. Believe it's so simple, yet it's so important. Uh, law enforcement has changed through history, as society has changed. I mean, we wake up, we put our pants on the same as you. We mow our lawns, we shop. We are citizens. I don't want to uh, trample on my civil rights. You know, I've got to don't call. Uh, hold on my phone. I don't, I'm the same as you guys. Uh, however, I, I told you, I'm, I don't take myself that seriously, but I take my job very seriously. And I play by the rules. And I demand that anybody around me, law enforcement, play by the, play by the rules. Whether it be uh, investigating a homicide or chasing a terrorist. So, uh, yes, bad things happen sometimes, and it makes front page news when law enforcement goes askew. Uh, Kevin, you know, it's good that Kevin is, is the checks and balances on the system. Uh, and we have to have that. That's why and that's why have courts and juries and judges. But anyway, uh, have we gotten better in 10 years? Absolutely. Uh, do we have a ways to go? Absolutely. Uh, this is not going away. Uh, you know, I'm not waiting, waiting for a new problem. This problem, I think, is here to stay. And I, I'm not trying to paint a dark picture, but these people, uh, when you can uh, kill yourself for a cause, you know, I guarantee you there's nobody in this room that would, would do that for the jihad or whatever. Uh, you know, we like to work work things out, negotiate. Uh, they don't, so I don't I don't suspect this is going to go away in our in my generation. But uh, you know, like I said earlier, we got to keep building uh, walls around us or or mechanisms to stop this, and they're going to try to think of a way around it. But we are better. Kevin, thoughts? 
No, I think because of uh, the three guys in this panel and the groups that they lead that we're dramatically safer. Uh, and people, I know there's a, some of you in the audience who are associated with, with these folks and with other organizations and we're demonstrably safe, uh, safer, we're, we're, we're better off and because they're, they're working and they're vigilant and as a citizen I'm uh, you know, relieved by that. And I think there's days that uh, uh, rights are uh, changed and altered and diminished in order to keep us safe and I, and I think that uh, that has happened and will continue to happen and, and needs to be uh, exposed and discussed when it does happen. All right, we're going to open it up to a few questions. We're a little bit over. Um, um, anyone for any any question for any panelist? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, speak into this, please. Okay. Thanks. Uh, in, in the spirit of the name, the title of this panel, "Chasing Criminals, Chasing Terrorists," uh, for Mr. Orton, Mr. Letter, from a law enforcement and a military uh, from those perspectives. Uh, could you comment on the similarities and differences in interrogation techniques, tactics, procedures that, uh, you know, that you share in common and where you diverge? Well, I, I'll start off. I had this discussion with Rick. I'm one of those 100% pacifist people. I don't believe in torture, period. I, I, that's just my personal thing. That is one order I'd probably choose not to follow. I wasn't even thinking that. Uh, that, would be, that would be me personally, regardless. Um, however, chasing people, for the military, it's somewhat of a simpler task, especially at my lower level. I was assigned, hey, look, that's a bad person right there. We want you guys to go catch that person. And that's easy enough. We don't really, outside of that, we don't really, you know, it's not, it's not that difficult. And majority of our operations were usually overseas. Uh, the planning would most likely take place either here or overseas, and then it would get executed overseas. So there was really not a whole lot of, of, uh, of uh, what I would call the murky environment there. However, at that time, if we did catch somebody, then what's the next step? Um, in a lot of cases, it would be the handover to a law enforcement organization, and that would involve who, to whoever or whomever held the jurisdiction. In a lot of cases, these people were handed off to Interpol. In a lot of cases, they would be handed off to the local national law enforcement authority. Or if they were, uh, for whatever reason, on the US list of, of criminals, we would hand them off to, uh, to the FBI or whomever the, uh, the, uh, the regional security office would appoint from the embassy. Uh, so that was, kind of, I hope that answered some of those questions. Sure question as to interview or interrogating uh, criminals versus terrorists. I've never interviewed or interrogated terrorists per se. I've interviewed and interrogated uh, dozens if not hundreds of criminals, well hundreds of criminals and maybe thousands but hundreds of murderers. Uh, my, I expected this question uh, so I, I, I thought about it. My answer is the same. You know, Human beings are human beings, you know. Uh, I was a polygrapher, so the object of a polygraph was not to determine truth or uh, a person lying. It was if once you well, I should say once you determine in, in my mind is to get a confession uh, because I just don't walk out of the room and say the person is lying. Do your job. But my job is to get a confession, and I did. I was relatively successful. Uh, you know, being nice to people, uh, being a good listener, uh, and I don't think it's any different between a terrorist and a criminal. Um, as you notice, in most of these attempted uh, cases, the, the Times Square, the underwear, well, the underwear bombers in trial right now, but many of these have pled guilty, and they admit, they, they cooperate, they don't, uh, they confess, because they want to be held up as a martyr, as a hero in their, in their world. Uh, so that's not always the case, but I, if I was to interview a terrorist, I'd treat it the same way as I treat a murderer or a burglar or a sex abuser. Just maybe as an aside along those lines, from, from a prosecutorial perspective, you know, the objective of interrogating somebody from a law enforcement prosecution perspective would be to obtain 
a statement which incriminates the person in some way, whether it's a confession or merely an admission, the idea would be that you're attempting to uh, obtain evidence toward a criminal prosecution. Under those circumstances, I would have to say that um, if you're going to treat it as a law enforcement operation, then you have to abide by the basic criminal procedure that we understand in this country to be the case in order to use it as evidence. Okay. On the other hand, on the other hand, if the objective is to gain intelligence, then you know those full plan of panoply of, of rights associated with criminal procedure and, and evidence gathering go out the window. And it's really a matter of um, you know what is the appropriate protocols that the uh, government has established for um, you know obtaining intelligence as opposed to gathering evidence for a criminal prosecution. So I mean I think there's a legitimate distinction between those two. But yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Comment. Um, I'm of the age yeah. that um, speaking to this briefly. Speaking to the I'm of the age group where hiding under my desk was going to was going to save me from an atomic weapon. So I just want you to know that you know we used to do the duck and cover drills. But saying that, during that time when I was growing up, what I was taught was that the difference between us and the Germans who we had just won a war over, or the communists who were about to take us over, was that in those countries, someone could just report something on someone else and it would be investigated and looked into. That's my comment on the Patriot Act and part, in part what Mr. Lewebrand was saying. And in line with that, you know, and they, if you see something, say something. And in line with that, the fact to hide behind the fact that, well, the Patriot Act is law, and therefore whatever we do to these people, we've done legally. There are a number of other laws that people were prosecuted under that we later found out were horrible, terrible laws. That's just a citizen's perspective. All right. One more question here? No. Um. My question was in the same vein on whether you think the panoply of things under the name of tips or safe communities or whatever, how much more sophisticated is that system than the Stasi or Savak was in its day? Is that okay? I, I would defend that in the following fact. I'm on the same side, kind of, I think, by implication of not liking it. I think everybody here doesn't like to have to live with that kind of a, a, a system. I mean, anytime that you implement a law like this, it, it's a measure above and beyond, meaning we really did this in response to a threat. Whereas some of the dictatorial and some of the, the, the oppressive governments out there it was an institutionalized behavior that they they created from the beginning. Um, I don't see gulags here. Um, I don't see this institutionalized, meaning our our checks and balances, our freedoms, our our press, our defense teams are still good enough. Um, and I think societally, we're a good enough open society to to protect ourselves to a certain degree. I would be the first one to, to defend against any abuse beyond that particular system. Meaning, and this is just kind of an interesting question is, um, and I think it was Padilla that, that was kind of, just kind of put away really without a whole lot of anything else. Um, right or wrong, I'm not sure, but however, if that, if that prevents, you know, it's that sort of very philosophical argument, is that one person's removal from society something that's going to save a million people because he didn't get to get their device? I, I, 
and I'm not sure whether he would have or not, I don't know, but is this tool adequate enough, yet restrictive enough, to allow for removal of somebody who is that crazy to actually try to pull something like that off from society at large from causing harm to themselves or someone else, yet, however, be restricted enough not to impact anyone else? I don't have an answer. I don't know. But I'll be the first one to defend anyone who goes beyond the scope. Does that make sense? I, I, well, yeah. I, I think That's we all. Nice I think we're all in, in a violent nice. agreement with That's that. That's very nice. Uh, uh, that really is very nice of you. But, but I don't. Your your ability to protect a Bradley Manning is what? It's once again. I think it's it's one of those where, as a group of individuals, under a free society, the organization of that is is the the fact that you and I are having this discussion and the fact that we can dedicate resources to defense and and in a nonviolent manner we can actually protect ourselves. He, I think it's a much more difficult area to defend your, your innocence. I truly believe that. I think any time that you as an individual have to where you have to defend your innocence versus defend your guilt, it, it's, it's a different organic mix almost immediately. I, these are just my gut, these are my personal gut sort of, you know, that's the way I feel. I can't speak for the rest of the Wait, panel. we have time for just one last question, and that's individuals been had their hand up for quite a while. Thank you. Uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, we talked about borders, uh, bringing up walls. I think the most important thing. You're going to have to keep your voice up that all of us uh, believe in this, in this, in these two rooms is that, you know, we, we take down some walls, speaking federally and on the state level, but that we don't build up walls among us as citizens, basically, like Mr. Horton said at the end, that we bring up walls to protect us as a nation. And my question was just at the end, because we've talked about prosecution and these sorts of things, like uh, maybe Mr. Litter, if you could speak about, you know, what venue is best to uh, actually prosecute people that, Figurative, figuratively and normatively stand outside the, the you know law. Basically, is it is it is it is it a a tribunal, a military tribunal well, like we've had in the past? Or? I'll just make a comment on that. I think it's clear that the criminal justice system plays an important role in our fight against terrorism, and and uh, I mean that's my role in the process. And I think that uh, recent events have borne it out. If you look at the number of cases that have. Uh, the terrorism-related cases that have been brought just in the last two years. There's a, a, a list of cases that I could provide you with uh, that would demonstrate how the criminal justice system can successfully deal with um, this problem that we, this new emerging threat that we're facing since 9/11. And uh, you know, the criminal justice system, with its protections, with the presumption of innocence with the right to a trial and, and uh, all of the protections that go with it, I think uh, e even, in, even with all those things, we can, we can still uh, address a lot, of the, a lot of the threat that we face. Uh, I, you know, I think back again in the, in the Pan Am case, and there was a lot of question uh, among the families back then about what to do with uh, the two Libyans who were initially accused. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I think back, uh, and, and note that it was interesting even back then that it was decided to use the criminal justice system. There's actually a trial held uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands, and one defendant was found guilty, another defendant was convicted. Uh, we've uh, done more than that going forward. I think, uh, I think the Justice Department has been very aggressive. They've used the tools of the criminal justice system. They've brought cases in court, and they've had great success. So together with the other tools that we've described, I think we're going the right direction, and I'm hopeful. Can I say one more thing to address the comments earlier about hiding under your desk and somebody calling you in and throwing you under the bus? Uh, see something, say something is just a, you know, something the MTA came up with that stuck. But pre-9-11, you know, if someone could, you got the poison pen. It, it's been around forever. Just give law enforcement some credit that they will act with common sense and you know, see if it's a legitimate, uh, you know, tip or it's it's a poison pen type of thing. All right, Rick. Turn it back over to Rick. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all, the panelists. Thank you very much for this discussion. We could stay here for five more hours, but if we did that. 
we would not be able to get to a little reception here uh, uh, put on by the rig and, and by us, and, and we're all invited to. Again, I want to thank each of the uh, panelists, uh, you know, Kevin, Jimmy, Boris, and uh, Rick, and of course Paul for steering the boat through these waters. Going to be around for a few minutes. If any further questions, feel free to ask them. And at this point, Paul. I just want to thank Rick for putting this wonderful event together. It's uh, good to know that uh, the University at Albany is uh, continually prodding and, and focusing discussions like this on major issues. And um, uh, I was remiss earlier in not uh, uh, introducing uh, President George Phillip uh, from the University, who was with us this evening. We uh, Good to see you here, George. I also want to acknowledge some special guests from Uganda. Who are visiting us along? Uh, who are visiting here with the uh, Center for International Development, and perhaps uh, they will be with us for the reception, and uh, we can have some international discussions as well. So, with that, uh, thank you all for coming uh, this evening, and uh, let's continue the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>